Burns, and this is The Third Degree with me, your host, James Major Burns. And ladies and gentlemen, I am here to celebrate one year, one anniversary of the podcast, The Third Degree with me, your host, James Major Burns. Yes, on May 9th, the podcast turned one year old. And, you know, I just want to thank the Academy for voting for me. I love you, Youngstown. Thank you so much. But no, seriously, I just want to thank everybody who listened, all of my supporters. You know, it was a really hard, a really hard journey, but I got through it and I got through it with everyone who helped me. But no, seriously, it's been a great journey and I can't believe I'm here. But, um, you know, remember, this is a safe space for myself and others to speak on things in our lives, in our worlds. This is a chance to share what's behind the minds of the creative, because what you see ain't always the truth. So here you get to share, laugh, live, love, and sometimes debate. Sometimes. But, you know, so far all the debates have been pretty good. We haven't, you know, poked any eyes out or lost any friendships. So maybe, maybe not. But, um, <laughs> but without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I have another guest. The first guest of season two is my biggest brother, my eldest brother, um, Mr. Ramon Cummings. Hey, how you doing? Every give it, everybody give it up for my big bro. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, who has been one of my biggest supporters and therapists. <laughs> I should really have him on payroll <laughs> because when I have a problem, I always call my biggest brother. Yeah, I just appreciate being a shoulder to lean on. Right, and he don't have... <laughs> no problem or hesitation getting me together in the nicest satisfaction. <laughs> so, no, um, but no, thank you for so much for being um, a guest. Like I said, I get so bored sometimes talking to myself. I'm like, well, you know what? I wish I had somebody else here um, to bounce this idea off of or just to know what they think or... I wish I could stream live or I wish the radio was live so somebody could call in. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to figure it out. And over time, I got to where I am now. And even from the beginning with the mechanics of the system and the sound and everything, I used to forget to plug the interface in all the time. I would just start an episode. We'd be 50 minutes in. And I'm like, oh, I forgot to plug the interface in. So it's literally a journey from the bottom to right above the bottom because that's where we at. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I definitely understand that. It's, it's just like life. You you build up the experience and then, I mean, you keep at it. You get better at it. Your production gets better. So, I mean, honestly, the quality from the first one to the last one, it's, the difference is there. And I think everybody is enjoying the journey, uh, going on the journey with you. Well, I, that sounds great. And I listen, I definitely hear the quality of um, from the first episode to the last. Because as I was coming up on the year, I was going back listening through some of the episodes. So I could just hear and what I've learned and what people um, discuss. But, you know, I was listening to an episode with this guy named Nasir Peterson. And he was in um, the cast of Shrek with me. But um, for like a couple of weeks, you know, during the pandemic, I got like writer's block and just creativity block completely. I couldn't do anything. So instead of trying to create anything, all I did was eat. I gained like 10 pounds. <laughs> like all I did was eat. But I went back listening to his episode and we were just talking about and discussing some things about the struggles of being an artist, but being a black male in musical theater. So it just reminded me of some of the advice I needed that I already had in the archives and I just went and hit play and it was right there when I needed it. But one of the, uh, you know, we, I ain't gonna say that yet. We're gonna get into that. But um, I'm happy to have you here as my brother and a supporter because I definitely contacted you when I was ready to make my podcast. So 
He's been with me every step of the way. So I'll be asking you some of your favorite moments too. But I actually, let me tell y'all, I started the second season out. I got outlines, y'all. I said, I always make outlines when I know who the guests will be. But now I'm trying to do it in advance. So I'll always have a topic and then I'll just plug somebody in if I can plug them in, you know. So I'll just shift and shuffle them out. But I'm trying to get a new format and how I'm going to do everything. But um, I want to talk about some of my favorite moments on the show. But I want to talk about episode one first. And I, it ain't going to be too long, you know. It ain't going to be like no drag, no boring little thing. But episode one, when I started the podcast, it took me like 30 minutes to actually start recording. Because I was so nervous. And I just sat at the table and I kept saying my name. And if you remember, Ramon, the first episode, I was like, greetings. 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 Yeah, greetings. Three men is a greeting. Right. But and the reason behind that, if I haven't said it on you know any of the episodes until now, was I was so nervous and I realized how long I was sitting at that table. I'm like, all right, I'm about to just press play or press record because I'm going a, I'm to a fall into it. And as I was sitting there doing it, I was like, you know what? I'm going to just keep this. And then I got into it just so I can get through it. And then I just went on. That was definitely a perfect learning moment, though. Like, you knew you had to really push yourself into it to, to the point to where you couldn't back out and you just had to just flow right on into it. Right. Let me tell you, I wanted to do a podcast years ago, but I just never did it. So when I had the podcast with my friends, if it wasn't for one of the friends coming in with the computer saying, we record right now. I don't know when we would have did it. So that's why I just press record. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna press record. If I need to edit something, I'm gonna edit it, but I must just start right now and see how it goes. But that was the first episode and that was over a year ago. And at first I was like, I wanna hit a hundred episodes by the year mark. And then February got here, March, April. I was like, well, we just gonna do the best we can. And <laughs> you know, what we have is what we have. No, I understand. But the question I have for you is, like, looking at that experience of, you know, the nerves, how has the podcast helped you grow as a person and an artist? So when I started the podcast, it was literally less than a month for me to leave to do Shrek. And I was gone for two and a half months. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm really excited to have this podcast, but... I didn't know how I was going to continue it while I was away. So I ended up having a, um, getting a new laptop and I took the equipment with me. And while I was down there, I actually um, interviewed the entire cast, interviewed the director. And I was doing two shows a day. And in between when I could have been resting, I was doing interviews. So I wasn't realizing even in the in the moment how hard I was working for something I said that I wanted. I guess in the moment I thought I was just, you know, I'm like, you know, I want to do this, so I'm doing it. And that was my mindset, but I didn't realize, you know, the format that I was creating for myself, the structure that I was um, creating for myself, or even the discipline. Because there were days where I was like, oh, you know what, I'm so tired, I just want to cancel. But then I'm like, no, because I need to get this done, and these days are the best days to record with the cast while they're, you know, near me. So I definitely um, grew as far as discipline the most because I got it done. I set a timeline for myself. But I will say one of the biggest things the podcast has taught me is how to listen during a conversation. Because a lot of times I want to, when somebody says something, whether it's exciting or I have a thought on it, I want to jump in and say what I got to say. And I used to do that because I would forget what I had to say, thinking it's the most important thing to be added to the conversation. But it really taught me how to sit back and listen over the time I would listen to the episodes. I'm like, you know what? I kept stepping on this person's toes. I didn't let them finish their thought. Let me, you know, pull back a little bit and understand so I can like, you know, get the, um, just have a better flow of the conversation. So discipline and listening are my two biggest things, I think. Yeah, that's what's up. 
because uh, let me tell you, I would cut, uh, you know, like Cardi B, and I'm quick to cut it off. It's like, no. But um, I definitely learned that. I, I mean, I was thinking about that today, actually, just having a conversation. Oh, and also how fast I speak. I don't know what I'm in a rush for, but I'll just get the going, and then you can't really understand exactly what I'm saying because it's just going so fast and kind of can slur a little bit. So I've been trying to slow down, you know, stay disciplined, slow down, and um, continue my journey. Yeah, going to school for journalism, like, that, which is totally different from broadcasting, but they still share similarities. Um, speech, uh, like I definitely have 10 communications, and you don't even realize normal conversation how you can just or how how fast you may be talking because you understand what you're saying right but to hear yourself back it helps you to understand okay how to properly have a conversation right it's a lot of times people will say that's what i sound like i was like yeah right. that's what you sound like but you know what, Ramon? I actually wrote down some things on my little notebook of what I've learned, and a bit, it's basically the same set, um, thing I said. But I put I learned how to manage and multitask, and um, I learned how to be consistent and persistent. Because I definitely yeah. wanted to keep up with the episodes, um, just so I can have that content out there. I just wanted to c continue to push myself creatively. Oh, and this is definitely a good outlet to do that on as well. I mean, because it's yours. Like, you can express whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. Right. You know what? I Even during conversations with people, sometimes I, I get into a, a mind, a head space of where I'm like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to, like I said, with cutting people off, I'm like, I don't want to come off rude or like I'm not listening and I just had to ask a question for them to say something. But um, I really don't like when I can tell somebody's just waiting to respond when I'm talking to them, you know? Yeah, but I mean, here's here's the thing that'll help you with that. People are different. So you have to realize because you're the host, you have to realize what your audience is. And I'm just, I'm not even talking about the people that's listening, like the person that's actually sitting in front of you and learning how to make that work. So if it's challenging to get someone to say something or they're just waiting to respond or they only have something to say when you ask a question, that is you exercising that muscle of how do I get the best out of this person? Because at the end of the day, it's your job to make it work. Right. So I would, there were times that I didn't want to cut somebody off because I felt like I had cut them off, but I really wanted to talk about other things, but I ended up letting them talk about what they wanted to talk about. So I'm like, you know what? I got to learn how to take control of the conversation, let them say what they want, but still control the conversation and then get back into, you know, my POV and why I asked them here. Right. Just help, like just helping to steer the show. Right. It, it also helps with consistency of that actual episode right but those are all learning experiences that i have learned you know over this last year but it helps me in other aspects of life also so that's what i like about doing anything or creating anything or being into anything that i can take and apply it to something else right it helps you not choke the shit out of tray <laughs> amen <laughs> period so I'll move on to a, a few fun things now. Um, I'll ask you first, what are some of the, f um, what, which question do I want to ask you first? So which was one of your favorite episodes that you did listen to and why? Um, let's see. The one when you did the review about <laughs> the war show. Ooh. That's definitely up there for me. I tried not to go in, Ramon, because I was like, I want to support my people. You know, I was like, I want to be here for y'all. But I had to tell the truth. Right. The truth is still the truth. And I mean, like, 
the the thing I like about when certain people give criticism, the best part is, okay, you say what's wrong, but then at the end of that conversation, like you don't leave it there. You talk about this could be better if you do this or if you plan it better, if this is put in place. So it wasn't just like tearing it down. Right, I didn't just bash them because I really wanted it to be successful and I did feel like it could be more successful than it is. It's just certain things. Like I felt like their biggest thing is if they would have hired like a um, a planner or whatever you call those people, uh, event planner for yeah. your event. Yeah. Also, another episode. Like there's a cluster of episodes I like because, so like when you had um, Curtis Curtis Jones. Oh yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I went to school with him in middle school, and. But when you had him on and Stacia, I think I pronounced it right, Stacy, Stacia. It's Stacy. Okay. Well, I went to school with her in high school. I don't know why I'm saying this. Right. But <laughs> when you had them on, they're both in the same industry, but it gives two different perspectives. Very. So it helps to like round, well round someone's thought process of getting into it or even being a customer of how it works like when you asked i remember specifically when you asked curtis about how how hairdressers can be more on time and not have clients backed up and waiting for hours at a time and like he went through certain steps that not only a hairdresser can take but also like it's hard scheduling but also what customers can do to help a hair dresser not be so far behind. Right. And like just those different aspects between those two from the same industry, like that that was pretty cool. I really did appreciate his well thought out answers for each question. You know, sometimes I feel like people can really be like, well, you know what? It just is what it is. Somebody show up late, the next person in the chair, you know, we just doing the best we can. But he was taking responsibility for sometimes it can go over or, you know, you know for a certain customer. And he, I thought he gave a pretty good explanation as to why, because of how loose the scheduling can be for, you know, um, you know like, um, a barber or somebody who does nails. I actually went to a barber one time and he had a lady who, it was his her first time in his chair and she was a little late for whatever reason, but he still wanted to give her a good experience. But because of his relationships with all of his customers, he let everybody know, hey, I'm running a little late. Is this okay? Every, you know, most of us are like, hey, you know what? I don't have anything else to do today. Yeah, it's okay. But when I asked him about the experience, you know, when he explained that, I know it was late. It was her first experience with me. I also didn't know her hair. So I had to take my time because I wanted to do a good job. So I appreciated how much he cared about his customer because it's not just about the product. It's not just about I'm going to get a haircut. That's not the reason you go to people and stay with people. Somebody can be the best barber in town, but it's about that experience. If you go and experience great times with them, good conversation, good vibes, you'll go back. But if they don't give you good vibes, if the shop is dirty, even if they a beast, you're like, you know what? I'm not coming back here. Absolutely. Customer customer service. Like, And people think of that only in you know the labor or working term. Right. But like literally just serving your audience with your performance and just investing in them just like they invest in you pretty much. Okay, so I'll ask you another question. What were some of the most shocking things that you heard during the episode you listened to? Hmm, shocking things? Yes. If you want to think about it for a second, I can go first. Well, I mean, there was one where you were early on starting out where there was a lot of shade. Oh, a lot of shade? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I throw so much, I don't, I, you know, it could have been any episode. Towards friends slash former friends. Oh, yes, I'm sure of it. For oh, years please. to come. I- <laughs> <laughs> I 
Because you said the, those like the, the were, were you really surprised though? <laughs> I wasn't surprised, but I mean, you got you kind of went Remy Ma. Ooh, let me tell you, I have you know since then I have you know changed my ways. I'm trying to work through those things, and the way I handle things sometimes or emotionally, but I um, am very vocal because of places I have been in my life to where I felt like I needed to verbally say it so I can get it out of my chest and try to work through it and for myself. And I know I can be I can be too vocal sometimes. Sometimes I should just keep it to myself. And I'm like, nah, 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 better. It's like Shrek says, better out than in, I always say. <laughs> uh, that's true. I mean, I enjoyed the episode. Yes, oh, <laughs> right. Now, I have a few shocking moments. I'll start with a funny one. Um, one of my new stage children, Thomas Les Smith, was telling an experience about when he went to an audition. And certain auditions, you get to stand in a room when somebody's auditioning. And one of his friends auditioned for him. I mean, before him. And he said the guy was so bad. He's like, James, I'm not even that great, but he was terrible. He said it was so bad they made him sing happy birthday. I said, I don't know. I said they did not have that man sing happy birthday. He said that he couldn't even sing happy birthday. I was like, dude. He was like, yeah, it was terrible. I'm like, this your friend? He was like, it was terrible. And he didn't want to tell the story, but when I tell you, he let it. <laughs> the way he told the story was so bad. He, he definitely juiced it up. It was good. It was good for TV, you know? But mm -hmm. that was that was the shady moment. That's one of the most shady moments. The most shocking moment was um, actually when Stacy she shared, um, you know what happened and how her mom's death happened, and she, it was a domestic violence case as to where a man she was with murdered her, and I was not expecting her to be, you know, willing to do that, and. Even to ask her to do that, I was so nervous because I didn't want to come off like, oh, I just want you to share your story. Even though I don't, I don't think I come off as that type of person, I just was still like, you know what, that's, that's touchy. And I actually didn't know until we got to the day of recording the podcast, I thought she, you know, might have been sick or something. And only reason I even questioned that is because Mother's Day had passed and she made a post on social media. So I was like, oh, you know what? I always think that, you know, people telling their stories can help somebody else. And I even know people that I think it can help. So I was like, if you don't mind, would you want to share what happened? But we discussed it beforehand. And when she was telling me, I was just like, wow, the strength, like the, even her being in the situation, growing up, seeing it. I'm like, the strength that you have, the type of person she is and her energy and her vibe. I'm like, wow, you've been through so much, but you have this light and this great vibe this joy that when i see you it's always this good time and you've been through such tragedies in your life but i guess that's you know it builds you know pressure builds diamonds and she goes by stacy diamond so uh, uh a phoenix rose from those ashes but that was definitely a, a shocking moment and i was i was pleased that she shared it but i thought it was like heart-wrenching but for her to share that i thought it was very strong and brave yeah, you just saying that back to me. Now I remember, like I remember that part of the episode, and uh, cause I was, I think I was driving to Youngstown when I had it planned. But um, no, yeah, that that was deep. Like, I mean, it's there's times where I'm sure she may not want to talk about it, but I mean, to put that out there and potentially help others, that that's amazing. Yes, I think he's very selfless. And she also had, she also said that she didn't even, she didn't share that story with like anyone because it's just nothing she ever like said out loud or, you know, was, I don't know if anybody ever asked her, but she was like, I don't even, I don't even talk about this out loud. It's like the first time I've ever talked about this out loud in however long. And I just like, again, I thought it was just so brave and just courageous for her to share that. Because the loss of someone is one thing, and how it happens affects you in a different way. Oh, but I thought it was, like I said, I thought it was amazing of her to do that. Um, I also had another girl share um, a story of her past of, of her struggle with um, bulimia. 
And it came out of nowhere. Like with Stacy, I planned on talking to her about that. I discussed it with her before being on camera because I said, you know, I didn't want to be like Wendy Williams. Uh, and, and it's no shade to Wendy, but you know, she has more of like a shady, hot topics. What's the scoop? We're trying to get the story, you know, like TMZ. But I didn't want anyone to think that I was trying to do that because, you know, sometimes how my care, um, not even my character, my personality can come off like that, you know, joking, making jokes all the time. I'm like, you know, certain things aren't jokes. But um, when she said it, I was like, oh my gosh. And I don't even think she planned on saying it, but we were having a conversation. She was just in it and she shared it. And I encouraged her. I said, don't be ashamed of that. You, you went through something, you're out on the other side and you made it, you know, you're stronger today. But um, she was so talented. She was one of the girls in uh, the cast of Shrek. And she was so talented and she still struggled with confidence. That's why with her, you know, or with anyone, because I struggled so much with my confidence growing up, I just try to be somebody that can influence or inspire them to be great by just getting them to recognize how great they are now. Not how great I think they are, but just how great they actually are. Well, I can dig it. But she was definitely... um a shocking surprise for me. But those were kind of sad. But some fun surprises, some funny surprises is, um, you know, Joshua William Green. His mom, and I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I always, it's like I wasn't more afraid of my friend's parents, but I, it's like I wanted to impress my friend's parents. I wanted them to, like, you know, like me or love me just as much as I had just love for their child but with um josh's mom i was always like afraid of her because i knew she was religious and you know me being gay i didn't know if she would have an issue with it or not so when i was younger i always had a guard up with anybody who came across like they could judge me so i was just like you know before you get me i get you sucker but um she always showed me love and the older i got also i want to add to that that when i was younger in my um early 20s I still felt like a kid talking to adults. And then one day I finally felt like an adult talking to another adult. So that changed my conversation with her also. But we had, we've had conversations and she's shown me so much love. But I, when I asked her to do the podcast, I didn't even know if she would want to do it. And when she said yes, I'm like, oh, this is great. So we were talking and I thought she was, you know, I had my perception of who she was based on what I knew of her and what Josh told me. But talking to her... Her name is Karen Clark Green. I said, I want to know the real Karen. Who was Karen Clark? Before she was green, before she was now cooks, who was Karen Clark? And we talked and we chopped it up like friends. Like I was literally getting to know her. And I'm like, this is so cool to have this opportunity to get to know my friend's mom on this type of level. But even my friends, like I learned so much about my friends I'm like, I don't even know why we haven't had this conversation. But the fact that I'm going out of my way to think about it. So when she told me she used to smoke weed, I said, Karen, girl, I know you ain't light up a joint. But it's because <laughs> I had her in my mind as this, you know, super, super churchy woman. And, you know, that's me misjudging her. It's a misconception I had about her. But she was like, yes, I tried it. She was like, I sure did. You know, she rolled up her little doobie and she tried it with, you know, her husband. But I, I had a lovely time getting to know her and hearing her story. And her episodes is actually one of my favorite. Man, when I tell you she was dropping knowledge, especially for artists who want to be in the entertainment industry, especially, especially for black females and men who want to be in the entertainment industry. I mean, she was a, a black opera singer coming up at a time, singing songs where, again, you know, just being her breaking down barriers creating legacies, being a black woman in an uh, arena where she quote unquote shouldn't be. But you can't deny God given talent in love because people are love. So that's one of my favorite episodes. Well, did I ask you what was one of your favorite already? Um, I think you did. My favorite episode was the one about the, <laughs> the one about that award. Oh, no, sure was. Again, <clears throat> Shout out to the Ohio Entertainment Awards. Y'all did y'all thing. 
I just wanted y'all to do it a little bit better. No, no shade. I just felt like it could have been some some better structure. We were there for too long. You can't have people sitting that long when they done paid money. And you, you cannot promise people things and then don't give them to it. Give them the things you promised, especially when we pay money. I'm still waiting on my plate of food. But it's cool. And you know how I feel about my food. But you can't, you can't do that. Don't, don't forget the red carpet now. Listen, I came dressed to impress, okay? Do you know how long I thought about my costume? Or not even my costume, my outfit. Like, I was like, what am I going to wear? I got options. You know, we just got these new suits. I was like, we got options, baby. What we wearing? No red carpet. I was like, oh, okay. They promised a lot of stuff. Like I said, it was just, I just hope that they can improve on that. And it makes me think about going back. I'm like, would I go back? For it to be the same thing, I couldn't do that. All right. I can support from a distance. Hell, no, maybe if it. I don't go, maybe I win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the fact that you were salty about that was a little bit funny, too. Oh, I wanted to win. Hell, I didn't want to win. I just wanted to get up there and be like, I want to thank the judges for picking me, my parents who raised me. I said, look, one of my goals, I want to win a Grammy. I want to win a Grammy, and, and I can be 47, and I'm going to be like, I want to thank the judges for picking me. 47? You make that sound like it's close to death. No, I'm just saying, that's it's, it's not 20 years away, but I'm just saying, whenever it happens, 47, 57, 67, I'm a, I want to thank my parents who you, raised me, and I hope Beyonce's you, watching. You can lie to your fans all you want to. Uh, 47 ain't 20 years away for you. I said almost 20, okay? Okay, don't do that. <laughs> Listen, I'm enjoying my... Do you know what? I I think the Lord was like, we're going to slow down 2020 because we know you about to be 30, so we're just going to stop the world. I said, cool. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, this pandemic has changed a lot. We were supposed to be turned up last weekend. Yeah, we were. And, and you know what was really the, like, the salt in the wound? Was what? how nice of a day it was because I was always worried. I'm like, I hope it don't nice rain. Day. What'd you say? It was the only nice day of the week last week. Right. Like, it was literally the only day. Because it was, was so it. cold. When, that Wednesday, <laughs> freezing. Mm hmm. And when I woke up that day, I was like, it's 70 degrees already. Yes. That was literally the only nice day last week. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wow. I, and then, you know, I wasn't even like, I was thinking about it, but the fact that everybody else started saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm like, all right, now I'm sad. Now I'm sad. <laughs> Shit, I was, I was trying not to think about it, but y'all keep telling me how sorry you are for me. I'm like, please let it go. I didn't let it go already. I wanted to be married today too. And then daddy called me. Our father is a legend, ladies and gentlemen. I will be, that's a, what I'm, my next goals I'm just going to switch the whole conversation up right now. So moving forward with my creative journey and how I learn and process things is weird for me because I don't understand it sometimes. Like when we're creating songs, sometimes these words come out of nowhere. Last night I was literally, I turned the TV off to go to sleep and I just started singing the song in my head. And I just bought this little um, little tape recorder thing so I don't have to like go to my phone or anything. I'm like, let me just go ahead, click this thing, get the idea out of my head immediately. But I just started singing this song and I you know, worked on it a little bit more. But I'm like, where was this coming from? Like I was about to go to bed. And then boom, I got this idea. So now I'm just like trying to work on those things. And I felt like I'm just kind of thinking outside the box of what my mind was focused on before. But um, I've been watching a lot of TV series and TV shows and for our next cabaret show I'm, I want to create some characters like they have characters on you know like in living color and you know all these um, type of sketch shows or these series but I'm like you know I, I want to work on a character and try to create a character but I tell you one I tell you it's gonna be after Sam Burns first I said, I, we getting Sam Burns on that state. I said, I got to do it somehow. I got to find the perfect way to create Sam Burns. But, you know, I got to give him the PG version. PG-13, something. You know, my audience. I don't know if that's possible. Right. I think I can do it a little bit. I was talking about him today. That man, he's, he's great, though. He's a great man. Honestly, it's like 
when you have that creative spark, like you don't know when the creation is going to happen in your mind. Like you could literally, like you said, you're about to go to bed. You can just be walking in the store, grocery shopping, and then just think of something. And like, you can't help yourself to not think about it. Like I literally was supposed to call you a couple of days ago because Oh, I had seen like this video with Leon and Robert Townsend. I was like, yo, y'all got to do a five heartbeat stage play. Listen, <laughs> okay, since, since you're bringing it up, we're going to switch the conversation up again. Those movies, well, I'll start by saying I've been doing this like whole evaluation of my life and all of these things that have influenced me to be the person I am today and why I have certain traits and certain things that I continue to do, whether I like or dislike them and where it all came from as you know, my journey to 30 is what I call it. Journey to 30. And, um, those movies influence me so much. And can I just say, and nobody could change my mind. The, the, uh, let me calm down. Cause I don't want to start cussing. Cause this is how strongly I feel about this. The bedroom scene with Bird and his little sister is one of the greatest scenes of all time. <laughs> it's one of the greatest scenes of oh, all you mean duck? time. You mean duck? Duck. Sorry, I said Bird. Who was Leon yeah. Bird? Oh, yeah. I, no, it's Duck, not Bird. It was Bird. Leon was JT. Right. Right. Okay. No, she killed that song. When I t- when I you can't nobody change, especially when you talk about musical movies. One of the greatest scenes. Of all <laughs> time. And can no one change my mind about that? Man, I still watch that thing. I'm like, this little girl sang. She made me feel like she was Aretha Franklin. Like she was singing. Like she felt all type of things and then been in love and had all type of heartbreak. Man, I loved it. They supposed to be cleaning up the room. I said, I know that day. I know that day right there. But for me, it's like that movie. Like, don't get me wrong. That is the best one. But it's like that movie has so many of those scenes, though. Because after that, my favorite scene, my second favorite scene, is when Duck was just like, when they had the house piano player, he was like, man, he must know my son. I can't do hey. this. He <laughs> was not happy. He straight threw him off the piano. And then Eddie just blew that mug out the water. Oh, man. Eddie came. Hey. Eddie King, Jane Lang, Jane Lang, man. <laughs> when he said, how does it feel to be me? Man. Bruh. Man, but when, no, that part though, I agree. And then when they had old dude hanging out the window. That, mm-hmm. that oh, whole movie, that, man. That's Bird. That was Bird that was hanging over the Okay, right, that's Bird. That, that whole movie. Oh, oh man, it, man, those movies, man. Thinking about bringing that to stage is like, I can see so many of y'all doing the parts. Like, I can see, I mean, of course, you, you Eddie Kang. <laughs> Ain't no doubt about Period. that. Period. But, like, I can see Josh, for real, for real, I can, I can see Josh being a heartbeat, but I, for real, for real, seeing him play Curtis in Dream Girls, I'm like, yeah, that's Big Red right there. Hey. <laughs> hey. For real. <laughs> And it's, I like different roles to challenge us, too. So it's something like he don't get to be the villain. Like the first time I got to be a villain on stage, I was trying mm-hmm. to process it. But community theater only gave me two weeks to actually do it. And I'm like, dang, I wish I could understand it better. But that's the thing about community theater that I like. It's like the, these reality TV shows that have them do create a dress in two days, create a whole line in three days that it take other professionals to do for months or years. So it like put us in this competition to get a work done faster than it usually should, but at a high level still. But with, you know, what what is, um, with Five Heartbeats, I would love to bring that to stage. And it's definitely something I'm willing to talk about and discuss with my friends. You see, that's what we're doing, working towards getting our, all of our own things. You know, our production company, our theater, but just creating those stories before all of that is what we're going to do. 
but I love the fact that we get to do it together and that I have the friends to do it. But you know one of my other favorite scenes, and I'm going to switch to another one, um, is when they got pulled over and they had to say, I've got nothing but love for you, baby. That. <laughs> oh, yeah. That scene, I was like, man. My dresser laid off. I was like, come on, dresser. I said, I okay. That. Okay, give him a lead. Come on, you better hold that lead down. And then finally, the, the ending song when they were at church, Eddie and his lady. I said, come on. Because she was singing. But as much as I love um, the five heartbeats, Temptations reign supreme for me. I mean, it's it's funny that it's almost like a renaissance because everybody everybody remember the best line in the movie and like now it's a meme. Right? Who knew? Who knew okay. that this that memes would become a thing? I just, I wish people would go and <laughs> find out where these things came from because even with the Felicia, I would be like, do y'all even know what you're saying? Do you know what that's from? Right. Well, you just saying it. You know, pay some respects and go watch Friday. Right, because you got people just running around saying that <laughs> ain't nobody come see you, Otis. Right. Don't, you better put some respect on Otis' name. Right. Don't know the history behind it. Right. But I tell you one thing. I'd be surprised if nobody saw The Temptations because VH1 wore Temptations out. Yep. No way you couldn't see it. VH1 wore Temptations out. I thought it was called Temptations H1. It wore that movie out. My my choir teacher used to just play that movie for us all the time. I'm like, okay, I like this, but is there anything else we can watch? <laughs> I'm like, are right. you, you going to throw that on? But <clears throat> um, And I love those two movies too. But you know what started it off for me, right? What? What's love got to do with it, baby? Uh. <laughs> hey, uh, that's that's the queen. That's the queen right there. That started it off for me. I mean, and as far as when I was talking about these movies, how they influenced me, when we were very young, maybe like six years old, um, me and Alan used to walk around singing that um, "Let It Shine." You know, this little light, just the way she sang it in the movie, and we would just walk around. We were singing it for Grandma, but that's how much those things influenced me, like these movies. Uh, Sister Act. I know that's not like a a, uh, a group movie, but that movie, man, I I used to sing Sister Act <laughs> down one and two. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love one. I respect one, but two, I I have it on DVD. But like, yeah, it came on TV, and I was just like, like just looking at the talent that was assembled. Like, I ain't seen nothing I, like it since. I mean, for me, like, I always tell people uh, one of the greatest musical tragedies was Lauren Hill, period. She should have been, she should have just been. Like, that, that's the it's only way. It's crazy. It is crazy. Because the she Fugees did. were amazing. Their music is just still, it's still just, I'm, I'm, that's why I prefer, I mean, I don't even want to say I don't listen to music today, but, you know, it's a different sound, but what they were bringing was just feel good. It was in your body. It was just feeling. You felt it. And, you know, when she did her own thing, whew, like, I remember, because I was young and stupid. I didn't realize that Lauren Hill was in Sister Act 2. I didn't know that was her. And then when I realized, I was like, oh, my God, that's Lauren Hill. I was like, mm -hmm. I already love you. And you know, by the time The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill came out, I was old enough to like music and understand it and listen to artists. And when she was dropping hits, I was like, dang, she is killing it. Dude, the Miseducation of Lauryn Hill literally is one of the few albums that I don't hit skip on. I just press play from one and just let it go all the way through. Is the song called Zion or To Zion? Uh, I think it's just called Zion. Man, that is my jam. No, uh, like that. I mean, that song alone is just, it's just something else. But like the entire album is just, oh, it's too Zion. But that entire album is just like, it's amazing. 
I love the conversations with the kids in the classroom. Oh, yeah, in between the song. I love it. When they would talk about love, what is love? Man, that, I, I, that did something to me. The older I got, when I was older and I listened to it. One thing I really like to do is go back, watch something, and try and remember how I felt watching it then versus now, like who I was then watching it, how I felt about it, what I thought about it. And those songs are when I got older and I listened to them. I'm like, wow, this is this is eye opening. <laughs> but um, X Factor alone solos anything. Yeah. Like I, I had my stages with that song for years, and it, it's still, um, what do you call it? It's um, just in the last few years, it's sampled in so many songs. I mean, songs that like went number one. Because Nice For What, it samples X Factor. And then Careful, Be Careful by Cardi B samples X Factor. Lauryn Hill out here still getting number ones. But it is, it is that, what, what happened to her. And I hear that she was trying to make new music, but it's so hard for artists to like her to regain any type of, you know, prominence in today's type of world uh i think well the, the problem with lauren hill is like it's almost like you just don't stop for her like she has as much as i love her as talent is immensely talented as she is she showed up to concerts three hours late and I mean, her performances, depending on what my state she's in, they can be classic Lauryn Hill, or they can be like that one VH1 joint she did where she was up there just talking and telling too much of her own business and didn't give a show. Yeah, and I'm not risking that. I ain't spending no money for that. Right, and like there's, I mean, she's been sued by actual fans. Like, you know, we spent two or three hundred dollars to come see you. You know, you were three hours late, or you or you show up three hours late, give us twenty minutes to show and walk off. Like, if if you don't respect the people that's in you, there's nothing good that's going to come out of it for you. Right, just like Silly said, nothing good gonna come from you. Uh. And what people don't realize is these artists have time slots as well. So she could be three hours late and have a four hour time slot. So she only has 20 minutes for a concert. So she gonna get there and give you what she can give you because she gotta get out of there too before she gotta pay more money. Right. And it's, but literally just being that tardy, who is that fair to? Uh, exactly. And nobody's ever going to try to understand the side of, well, you know, I only got 20 minutes left. It's like, yeah, well, you shouldn't have been that late. Right. But she was amazing. She'd go down as one of the best to never do it. Yeah, I've always, like, when it, when it comes to stuff like that, like, I've always said, the top three greatest musical tragedies is Lauryn Hill. I mean, just for me personally, but Lauryn Hill, Michael Jackson, and Whitney Houston. Because at the end of the day, as great as Mike was, we were still robbed of so many things because of, honestly, because of, you know, him just being too nice sometimes. You know, people are always out to get him and, you know, just psychological things that he's been through. And, I mean, Whitney robbed us with the drugs. I understand she had been through some things, but it was just like, they, they could have been more, even though you look at what they've done. Right. I tell you, I felt like my aunt died when Whitney died. Whew. <laughs> I was, I was like, in my head, I felt like I was still going to meet her. I was like, I haven't even met you. Uh, this can't be. And I'm, you know, but, but she was somebody who I just remember the first time seeing her. I was like, who is this lady sitting in this chair in this snow by this river? And it's freezing, but she's just in a suit. 
but she's beautiful and she sounds amazing. And that was the I, Al I Will Always Love You video. And then I fell in love with Bodyguard. I don't know how old I was watching that movie, but I think I was just mesmerized by her, like her beauty, her smile was just like everything. And it, oh, I don't mesmerize because uh, that's the only time I ever wanted to be a white dude. I wanted to be Kevin Costner so bad. <laughs> and then um, the preacher's wife, though, that's my that's my flick. Here's the thing. I think because my mom watched it so much, I hate that movie. Wow. Like, I watched it a lot. And, and, and for real, for real, it's like, I got to the point to where I just like start nitpicking it so bad. Like the little boy, cute kid, the horrific actor. Right. Dudley. <laughs> That's horrific. Oh, no. I leave, I leave my boy Jeremiah alone. Jeremiah was terrible. The, like, the little boy that ended up getting taken was better than him. Mm. I love that movie, though. I, I don't know why I love it so much, but it just had a great spirit and just the memories of where I was watching it, like, at my grandmother's house with, like, my cousins and stuff. So it just bring me, um, bring joy back to me. But Whitney was just, you know, when I got older, I continued listening to her and felt like I was getting to know her, but I loved her music. I loved everything she did. I felt bad for her every time something was going wrong. And then when she went out the way she did, I was just so sad. That's because, like, everybody was just rooting for her. And I think when she realized she destroyed her voice to the point of it never being what it was going to be, she couldn't handle it. Yeah, you know, it was like, I remember that it was, I think it was like in 2004, I forgot what she sang. It was like one of her first performances in a while. It was definitely after the anniversary with the Jacksons when, you know, when she came out wanting to be starting something. That was bad. Yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. Like if I watch that on YouTube, I still try to skip that part. She always be Whitney to me though. I'm like, all right, come on, Queen, go ahead, get it. But um, yeah, she was one of the greatest to ever do it, man. She was one of the greatest to ever do it. They always post um those things on Facebook, like if you could go to one person's concert and they have like her, Mike, Tupac, and a bunch of other people, like Biggie, Left Eye, a bunch of people. I'm like, I'm probably going to see Whitney. I'm like, I. And I, I know Mike's show gonna be amazing. I know his show is gonna be amazing, but I'm like, I'm probably going to see Whitney. Especially Prime Whitney, I'm going to see mm -hmm. it. Gotta go see it. I used to listen to her lives, just sitting in the car. I'd be sitting at home just crying, listening to her music. I'm like, it's just so beautiful. It just would just take me through so many type of emotions, but. And then I just thought she was absolutely stunning. Because she was. Yeah, but she's she definitely... Was, she was a treasure. I think that's a great way to describe her. She was definitely a treasure. And unfortunately, it's, it's not just her, but people around her, they didn't cherish that treasure. Right, man. It was... It'll be a story to remember, though. Absolutely, but I mean, it's just, she just deserved more. Like, it's like not even just her, but like, when you look at how Bobby Christina died and yeah. how the family handled all of that. Right, right. It was really, really, really couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe, I didn't believe it when the story came out. <laughs> mm hmm. But, well, and especially, like, did dude get off for that, or did he get any type of punishment for that? I don't think so. You, I think he's dead, too. Yeah, he is. He overdosed a couple years ago. Mm. And even with that, it's like, you know, he swore he didn't do anything. 
eaten and killed himself. <laughs> Why? Right. And that's crazy, man, because you the whole world got to see how close Bobby and um, Whitney were through their show and just through the media and everything. Mm -hmm. So you know she struggled because her mom was her whole world and then for her to go out like the way she did and it's not, you know, it's no way we could ever know what actually happened because we weren't there. Right. You know, it's funny, I was just listening to the cadence of how I speak <laughs> and now I'm thinking about it so hard. I'm like, do I speak like that all the time? I mean, it's cool now. Right. But, um, so what do you call the conversations you're having with these people on Facebook Live about, like, sports and stuff? I mean, I don't really call it anything right now. It was just an experimental thing to see how it would go. You know, to see the things I may have to work on or do. Let me tell you how decent of an individual I am, right? Because as much as I want to chime in about stuff, I don't mm -hmm. know enough about anything y'all talking about. So I'm like, I can't even have an opinion. I'm like, I want to be a part of this, but I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know any of these stats. I know half these people. I don't know what any of this means. So I'm going to just go ahead and sit back. I'm going to just listen. I'm going to just listen and read these comments. And it just let me know how disconnected I've been from sports for, you know, some time now. But, you know, I got other things I'm doing. But I'm like, dang, I don't know. Especially the NBA and, like, players today. But I never knew much about the college sports and stuff. But I'm like, oh, that, that looks like a fun conversation. But it looks very entertaining and exciting for the people I see involved. I mean, this... <laughs> For me, sports have, has always been one of my favorite things, and I just have a memory that works in a way of remembering details about certain things. Not everything, but just certain things. And as far as college goes, I live in Columbus, so... Right. <laughs> being a college football living here. I know you love o Ohio State. All day, every day. Oh, hey, yeah. I want the coronavirus to clear up. Not because I want world health and world peace. Just so I can have football. Right. <laughs> That's all I want. It's like like Tina said, just want your name. You just want football. Like, I don't watch tennis like you do, but, you know, when they cancel Wimbledon, I was just like, excuse me? When they canceled Indian Wells, I was like, uh, <laughs> what? For who? Exactly. Miss Rona. What? Okay. I'm like, all right. Hopefully we do Miami. Cancel Miami. Cancel the French Open. The French Open canceled early. I was like, dang. That's early. And then they rescheduled into September. But they're not doing September now. I think they're all canceled. I'm salty. I'm like, look, we ain't got no time for Serena to be taking no year off. Yeah, she getting up there. She gonna be thirty nine in September. It's crazy yeah. to think this chick about to be playing at the same level professional tennis. Her and Federer, forty years old. I mean, we gotta see him do it first, right? Because as cold as Serena is, ain't the Serena from five to seven years ago. Oh, she ain't. Oh, I tell you, it broke my heart every time. All these last four Grand Slams. Oh, Ramon, you, do you, you don't know the type of fan I am. When I tell you I will cut the TV off at the last drop of the last ball if she lose, I, I'm like, there's no need for me to watch. For what? No, I'm cutting this off. I, I did it at the Australian Open. These la every, I'm like, okay, bye. I feel bad. I can't even be fans of these girls. I, I feel like I'll only be a real fan if and when she retires. U.S. Open, the last time she had the shot at the uh, the calendar slam. Actually, the golden slam, because I think the Olympics was that year. No, no, nah, nah, she lost in 2016. That was 2015. Oh, okay. But when she, when she almost had that calendar slam and she lost. <laughs> Did you even watch the U.S. Open finals? No. <laughs> Who 
please. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But let me tell you one thing, though. I have seen Serena play, and I've studied her. I, and I knew she wasn't going to be able to just let go in that match against that girl because she was playing. It's, it's always like one match that's her really, really tough match. And it's usually in the quarterfinals, but the player she was playing had all these different things for her. And she played until the fourth set, and it was, you know, lost 6-4. But I'm like, I just don't get what you can't, why you can't get across this hurdle. But when she gets to certain numbers as far as slams or certain records, you know, the pressure gets really hard for her. Because when she was getting close to tying and then passing uh, Christy and Martina, oh, she was just, she, she played horrible in the slams. She lost yeah. before the quarterfinals like three or four times in a row. And it was like, dang. <clears throat> but she was the number one player in the world. Yeah. And she just couldn't get it. And then when she did win and tie them, she won the next three, and that was the second Serena slam. I'm like, come on, girl, just get that one, please. <laughs> I'd be counting these slams on like, Serena should have won the 2011 U.S. Open when she lost to Samantha Sosa. That was supposed to be hers. But Samantha came out there and played, I don't know, Serena had gotten back, but she was playing good in the summer. But she had been off for like a year. I was like, nah, man, you should have got that. You should, that should have been hers. There's a few other ones I'm like, yeah, that Serena, you should have had that, man, for real. You know, the one against Naomi, I, you know, that one I can never say if what would have happened if that point didn't play out. But I do think that Naomi was kind of like cracking under pressure towards the end of the um, second set. And I just think, I just thought that was so unfair. But, um, you know, ain't no thing but a thing. And then when she lost to Simona Halep at Wimbledon? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I don't even watch it. I couldn't. I don't know if I couldn't watch it, but I was just like, What's going on? I was just, I was in disbelief. I was so upset. Usually I don't get upset, I just get hurt. <laughs> I was upset that time. I said, Serena, no, okay. And when she lost to Bianca, I was like, she, that was the best she had played in the final at least. So I, what I took from it was, at least you played better than you have before. And that girl though played, she just outplayed you. That girl was playing her ass off. But I get so mad, though, when these girls go for broke against Serena. I'm like, they just be out there going for broke. It's, like, so hard for you to just let go because of the pressure. But it's like a person that just play the best. They play the best they've ever played against Serena in the final. I mean, with the iron sharpens iron, the best going to bring the best out of you. Right. That's like case in point. You look at people who you've been on stage with, like just the entire cast, and you look at some of your performances and you can say, well, all right, maybe this was a B-plus performance or a C-plus performance. And you can, some, a lot of times, you can look at the cast. But, like, then you go to a show like your breakout show, The Wiz, or you go to Dream Girls and you look at the work that was put in on top of the talent that was there. You couldn't walk out on that stage without your A game. Because you know everybody else is bringing it. Period. That's right. Like, we, we know we know what voices... Like, you, you was on the stage with Josh. So you gonna bring out your uh, your B plus vocal? <laughs> <laughs> right, absolutely not. I understand that completely. That's how I feel every time Sam Burns is sitting in the audience. That's what I'm saying. Because he will let me have it. Exactly. So you knew he was there. You ain't even know your mama was there. That was one of the best surprises ever. That was one of the best surprises ever. And they got that on film. I wish they had a little bit more on film. But that was so cool. I was so excited. I was like, oh, my gosh. That just made me so happy. I forgot about that. But, yeah, that was so cool. I didn't think she would be able to make it. And she surprised us because when you see to this, then she came in, and she was like, uh, she was like, you don't know I'm here. I was like, oh, okay. And she couldn't wait to see you. That was so great. I'm so happy because 
we were talking about it and she was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to make it. I was like, okay, it's okay. I'll see you soon. But I really wanted her to see it because I'm like, you have to see this one. This is the one to see. Um, yeah, I'm like, we're about to do it big. Mom Bobby had her tickets and something important, really important had came up. And she ended up giving her ticket to somebody else, but she was extremely upset that she couldn't make it. I know, I know. Because she would have loved it. I just love that we got to do that for the city. I just love that they get to see themselves on stage like that. Because the kids do get inspired when they see that. I remember, you know, one of the first stage performances I saw was the Youngstown Connection. But there were so many black people in that in the connection, I was just like, oh my God, this is, I think this is what I want to do. I'm like, I, I, I just, because growing up singing, I didn't have like an R&B voice, but I didn't know what to call the voice I had. I'm like, this sound weird, but it, it, it didn't, I guess it, it was too like clean and straight for me. Um, but I didn't realize, you know, how often I would sound like a the theater or a theatrical until I saw the Youngstown Connection and the type of style that they had. And I was like, I want to do that. And then I joined the um, Junior Connection and I never performed with them again. <laughs> Cause they said I couldn't play sports. I was like, oh, not in my household. You don't know my father. <laughs> now they said it's either sports or singing. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bow out right now. Right. And I don't like to look back and be like, I wish I would have. <laughs> I don't like to look back and say, I wish I would have just went to the connection because, you know, I'm happy with where I've ended up and what I've done so far, even though I feel sometimes that I could have done so much by now or, or want to do so much more. I'm just still on our journey, Trey and I are still on our journey to achieving everything we want. And can't no corona stop that. Please. That's the spirit. But no. We are definitely going to have some things to introduce to the world pretty soon here so everybody keep an eye out for Trey Major always because we come in with that heat I can't I was gonna say it's bad boy baby but that's not my tagline <laughs> <laughs> I really thought about it for a second I was like no don't say that that's not my tagline but shout out to Sean P. Diddy Combs because I love that boy <laughs> I'm gonna think of a tagline to say though I'm sure you will Right, but for now, it's Trey Major always. <laughs> but um, Ramon, I would like to thank you so much for being my first guest on season two. But we will definitely hear from you again because we have some other interesting topics to discuss for the world and everybody around the world. And you know what? You were my first call interview. Well, I appreciate it. I'm happy I was able to help out. Hope people enjoy the episode and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next time we will introduce you to the world and help the world get to know me in a different way. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. So you people stay tuned. And this has been The Third Degree with me, James Major Burns.